We're here today at the uh, Embassy of Israel in London to interview His Excellency uh, Mark Gregor, Israel's ambassador to the UK. Uh, Mark, it's an absolute pleasure to have this opportunity to interview you today. Many of our viewers will know you very fondly from your very combative style interviews in defending Israel with some very tough journalists, uh, such as on Channel 4 and BBC and others. Um, but can you tell us about the new role that you've got as an ambassador rather than being the Israeli Prime Minister's spokesman? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be with you. There are actually, I, I, I probably think there's more continuity in the two roles. It's true, I'm, I'm now the ambassador, and I'm happy to say that I've already uh, presented my credentials to Her Majesty the Queen, and I'm officially have started my duties. But there is a certain similarity between the two roles, between being the spokesman for the government and now being ambassador here. Ultimately, it's my job a job that I take very seriously is to make the case for Israel here in the United Kingdom. And I take that job very seriously. And I hope that my previous position as government spokesperson will give me the skills to do that job here in London effectively. Uh, what do you think the challenges are for you and the Israeli embassy, particularly here in Britain? as? You know, London is probably one of the world's media centres. We have so many foreign journalists based here. This is, um, you know, broadcasts around the world are based in London with so many different media companies and what have you. Um, what is the unique challenge here for Israel in order to communicate her message of peace and one of security to an audience, particularly from liberal left-wing media that is very biased against Israel in their news reporting? I want... British people to understand that ultimately Israel is very much like them. I mean, if you look at the vast expanse of the Middle East, from Morocco on the Atlantic shore through to Iraq, Afghanistan, in Central Asia, in this vast geographical expanse, there's only one country that has regular real elections. Only one country with free press, free universities, human rights, freedom of religion. Only one country that, that strictly protects the civil rights of all its citizens. There's only one country that preaches pluralism and tolerance, live and let live, and that country is Israel. And so in the vast greater Middle East, the only country that represents the values that Britain prides itself on is Israel. And I think that's a basis for a very, very strong partnership between the two countries. We ultimately share common values. And today, more than ever before, those common values are augmented by common interests. Because let's be clear, a lot of the people who, who hate my country, they hate the West and they hate Britain. And we are allies in the struggle against groups like ISIS and other extremist groups who threaten our common civilization. So what do you think that uh, Britain and particularly uh, the European Union can uh, learn from Israel's experience in dealing with, with terrorism, um, particularly in light of the unprecedented terror threats and uh, terrorist attacks we're now seeing on the continent of Europe? I as an Israeli don't claim to have a monopoly on, on truth or understanding. But I do know that we have over the years developed a certain amount of expertise in Israel in fighting against terrorism. We didn't want to develop that expertise. We had to develop that expertise. And I think that expertise is relevant today for democratic governments across the globe, and of course, including here in Britain. And we are working very closely, the United Kingdom and the State of Israel, on issues like counterterrorism, but also on new issues issues that weren't there 10 years ago, but are today very, very relevant. The whole issue of cyber, of cyber security, of cyber terrorism, this is the, not just the next frontier, we're already there now, and we have to work together. And here I think Israel has an advantage. We've got uh, knowledge that we're working together and sharing with our British uh, counterparts uh, to fight against that sort of terrorism too. And can you share with us uh, something about the strength of the relationship between uh, Britain and Israel, two strong democracies? Well, you know, the relationship goes back a century. 
And next year we'll be celebrating the anniversary, 100 years, to the famous Balfour Declaration, which was the first time a, a, a global power since antiquity, the first time in the modern period, when a global power stood up and supported the Jewish people's right to national self-determination in their historic homeland. And so next year, we'll be marking that event together with, with the British government. And what has been achieved so far? I mean, the Balfour Declaration led to the mandate, led to the League of Nations endorsing the principle of national self-determination for the Jewish people. That League of, Nandate, League of Nations uh, uh, decision was re-endorsed by the United Nations when it was established. And so in many ways, Balfour is the beginning of the process of the creation of the State of Israel. And you know, objectively, by any criteria, Israel is an amazing success story. I said a moment ago, we're the only democracy in a very vast landmass. But more than that, we gave a home to the homeless. We took a persecuted and discriminated against people maybe persecuted more than any other people in the history of humanity. And we made them free and independent, sovereign, with the ability to defend themselves. We took people who came to our country as refugees with nothing but the, the shirt on their backs, and we've created a modern high-tech economy where Israel today leads in, in, in so many technological areas and doing amazing things. Just pick up your cell phone. How many components in that smartphone were made in Israel, were developed in Israel. And so we've built a strong democracy, we've built a strong economy, we're out there in base, embracing the knowledge century, the 21st century. I'm very optimistic about Israel's future. Excellent. And uh, I, have to, I have to ask you that uh, we, we've just um, remembered the first anniversary of the um, signing of the Iran deal regarding Iran's uh, controversial nuclear weapons program. Um, do you believe that agreement is going to prevent Iran from require, gaining nuclear weapons or does the international community need to do more to ensure that Iran doesn't produce those weapons and sticks to those guidelines of the agreement? The agreement we thought was a mistake, but that's behind us now. The agreement makes it much more difficult for the Iranians to get a nuclear weapon in the short term but unfortunately makes it easier for them to get one in 10 or 15 years. So today we're calling for Iran to abide by all its obligations under the agreement. It's important that we keep Iran's feet to the fire. It's also important that we make sure that Iran keeps its other international obligations, its support for terrorism, its support for regional aggression, its ballistic missile program, all those issues that are not in the agreement, Iran must be held accountable. I ultimately say this, if Iran wants to be treated like a normal country, it should first start acting like a normal country. A normal country doesn't support terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas. A normal country isn't sending its, its armed forces and its military assistance to Yemen and to Syria to pop up Assad's regime and so forth. A normal country doesn't act the way Iran does. I hope that the Iranian regime will change its behavior. I hope that we'll be wrong, that the nuclear deal that was signed will in fact prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Unfortunately, I see a regime today that remains very, very extreme, very, very aggressive and very dangerous. And I don't see the signs that that's gonna change soon. And when we look at the rest of the, uh, the Middle East, particularly with the old borders really breaking down thanks to the emergence of the Arab Spring back in uh, 2010. Uh, we see that uh, Israel's old borders such as the ones uh, next to Syria and also in the Sinai next to Egypt have, have changed. They're no longer stable secure borders. What is the regional challenge facing Israel with the emergence of ISIS and the emergence of other extreme um, terrorist and Islamic organizations? It's true that Israel is, is facing unprecedented challenges. We've seen a whole series of states that have been in existence, have been in existence for decades, and we're seeing them implode and collapse. Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya. 
and into the cracks we're seeing, unfortunately, the most violent extremists, groups like ISIS. Uh, and they're very dangerous. They're very dangerous for Israel. They're very dangerous for countries like the United Kingdom. They're very dangerous for the local people who they butcher. But there's also an opportunity. There's also hope. Because we're seeing more and more Arab governments across the region understand that in the fight against this sort of brutal extremism, that Israel's not their enemy. Israel's on their side of the divide. And we're seeing today a much stronger dialogue between Israel and the Arab world than ever before. And I hope that this, this enhanced dialogue between Israel and the Arab world will be good for peace, because that's ultimately we want, we, what we want. We want peace. Yeah. So there are challenges, there are opportunities, and the responsibility of government is to navigate between the two, to make sure that we are ready to meet the threats, and they are there and they're very real, and at the same time, to be able to utilize opportunities where they exist to make a safer, more secure, and more peaceful Middle East. Uh, France, the French government, have been at the uh, forefront of pushing for a recognition of a unilateral Palestinian state, particularly at the UN level and also at uh, the European Union level. What are the dangers for Israel of a unilateral Palestinian state outside the negotiated framework of the Oslo Accords between the Israelis and the Palestinians? The only way to peace is through dialogue, through Israelis and Palestinians sitting across the negotiating table putting their concerns on the table and finding agreements. That's the only way. Everything else won't work. We need direct talks. And Israel has been saying for years now, we're ready for the immediate resumption of direct peace talks without any preconditions, any preconditions whatsoever. We're ready to start. We're ready to start now. Unfortunately, the Palestinian leaders have not been willing to sit and talk. They've run away from negotiations. And we don't like initiatives which justify the Palestinians' refusal to negotiate. We think that's a mistake. Any international uh, 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 support for a Palestinian position that it's good not to negotiate, we think, is a mistake. Now, we want peace, and we want peace with the Palestinians. We want a secure peace, a just peace, a peace based on two states for two peoples. We hope the Palestinians will return to the negotiating table and negotiate such a peace. And do you think that uh, Europe can play a better role in terms of uh, European foreign policy towards Israel? We're seeing nothing but hostile policies, particularly the EU guidelines, the EU labelling products, um, pushing for a unilateral Palestinian state, even um, British aid money and European aid money going to build Palestinian homes in Area C under Israeli control. Um, surely that is not helpful in helping to bring about a climate and a platform for peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I think Europe could be playing a much more positive role uh, by, by being more assertive with the Palestinians. The whole peace process is based on a letter that was written before the Oslo agreements by the then leader of the Palestinians, Chairman Arafat, to the then Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin. And in that letter, on which the whole peace process is based, the Palestinians made two fundamental commitments. One, to totally relinquish terrorism. And two, to solve all outstanding issues through negotiations. Well, unfortunately, we haven't seen an end of terrorism. Terrorism continues. And I'm not just talking about Hamas terrorism, but I'm also, unfortunately, we've seen terrorism from the West Bank. We've seen the Palestinian Authority, unfortunately, give financial uh, inducements to people to conduct terrorist op operations. And we've seen the praise by official Palestinian media, official Palestinian leadership of terrorists. So that's one commitment they're not keeping. And the second commitment to solve all outstanding issues through negotiations, unfortunately, they refuse to negotiate. And I think it's time Europe held the Palestinians, Palestinians accountable. Mark, I have to ask you, uh, so many of our viewers are passionate about Israel. They are passionate supporters of Israel. Um, what can they do to help support you, the state of Israel, and uh, Israel and the Jewish people during this very difficult time to proclaim the truth regarding Israel's situation in the Middle East today? First of all, 
come and visit Israel. See with your own eyes. And if you've come before, come again. I think there's always something new you can learn and experience from a, another trip to Israel. Secondly, make your voice heard. Israel's opponents, Israel's enemies, don't have any embarrassment about standing up and making their voice heard. I think it's time Israel's friends stood up and said proudly that they stand by Israel and why they stand by Israel. They stand by Israel because Israel wants peace and Israel isn't the obstacle to peace. They stand by Israel because Israel's a democracy, the only democracy in the region. These are facts that, that must be said and reset. And I think it's time that those people who consider themselves friends of Israel are stand up and counted. It's time to take a love for Israel and turn it into tangible political behavior. And there are ways to do that. Uh, Mark, I just want to thank you so much for giving me this opportunity today to interview you here at the Israeli Embassy in London.